Hello and welcome uh, to a new semester here at the University of Minnesota and to the 14th Annual Science Studies Symposium. Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science hosts this annual Science Studies Symposium. I'm Alan Love, the director of the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science, and I want to just highlight at the beginning a little bit about why we do it. It's an opportunity for scholars from diverse areas at the University of Minnesota to communicate their research related to the nature, dynamics, and intricacies of one or more of the sciences, including broader implications for scholarship and society. Past lectures have featured faculty from architecture, art, bioethics, food science and nutrition, the Institute on Child Development, Genetic Cell uh, Biology and Development, Law, Statistics, the Medical School, Ecology, Evolution and Behavior, and the Stem Cell Institute. And today we are privileged to have Professor Matt McGew from the Department of Psychology here at the University of Minnesota, where he is also a Regents Professor. He is a behavioral geneticist with two primary areas of interest in his research, the development of substance abuse disorders from adolescent to adulthood, and genetic contributions to normative aging processes and mortality. He uses a number of study designs to get at those, in particular uh, twin studies, and he is heavily involved in the Minnesota Twin Family Study, as well as the Sibling Interaction and Behavior Study and Research on Adoption. He also works with uh, Danish colleagues on questions about aging, where he is a guest professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Southern Denmark. He has been publishing on these and many other topics for more than 40 years um, and has been recognized for uh, many of these uh, contributions. Uh, he's won the Dobzhansky Award for Lifetime Contributions to Behavioral Genetic Research and the Shields Award for Lifetime Contributions to Twin Research and also has been a past president of the Behavior Genetics Association and the International Society for Twin Research. Today, he's gonna to talk to us about Far From the Tree, Evolving Perspectives on the Nature of Parent to Offspring Transmission. Um, Matt, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Let me, okay, make sure I can do this. I think that should be okay. Is that good, Alan? Yes, we can see them. Okay, great. Thanks. And thanks for that really nice introduction. Actually, and and thank, thank people for coming uh, today on a Friday afternoon, although it's cold out, so I don't know that there's that many alternatives. Um, this is actually not the first time I've talked at the Minnesota Center for Philosophy of Science. Uh, more than 30 years ago, I, I was a young assistant professor at the time, and I was invited uh, by Philip Kircher, Kitcher, I guess, uh, to, to come talk on the genetics of intelligence. Uh, I actually don't think Philip really enjoyed my talk that much, so I really welcome Alan this opportunity to kind of redeem myself uh, some 30 odd years later. And I'm going to begin with the uh, acknowledgement of uh, the many, many people uh, that I've worked with over more than 30 years now, because I, I, I want to keep within the time limit and I might cut things at the end, but I definitely don't want to cut the acknowledgement of uh, I, the, the research I'll talk about has uh, been done under the auspices of the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research. And there are hundreds and hundreds of people that have worked at the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research, collecting the data, processing the data, analyzing and reporting the data. Here are many here um, uh, at, at a recent, I guess, online meeting we had. Uh, the, the center was begun in 1987. It's been funded continuously since then, externally through various uh, grants from the NIH and its institutes. And the major focus, we do longitudinal research, and you'll learn a little bit more about that as we go through here. Uh, we do longitudinal behavioral research with a focus on the origins and consequences of substance abuse. Although I'm not gonna talk anything about that here uh, this afternoon. I, 
especially want to single out these individuals because the work I will be talking about has been done in collaboration uh, with a good colleague of mine, James Lee, who's a professor in the Department of Psychology, as well as a, a very accomplished and productive set of graduate students and postdocs at the University of Minnesota, including a Emily Willoughby, Lisa Anderson, Lindsay Matson, Alex Janellis, and Yuri Kim. I, I didn't have a picture of Yuri. Um, of course, any mistakes I, I, I make here today are, are my responsibility, not theirs, but I will be talking about their work. The Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research has been concerned with the, trying to understand the development of substance abuse disorders like alcoholism. But today, what I really wanna talk about is, is a topic that I've long been interested in, and that is parenting. Um, there's a widespread belief that we are shaped psychologically by the homes we grew up in, by the parents we have. If you walk down the aisle of, uh, of, of self-help books at your uh, local bookstore, assuming they still exist, hopefully they do, um, though you'll be greeted by many books that'll uh, explain to you how to be a good parent. If you pick up a biography, it's almost obligatory that the first chapter of a biography goes through who the principal's parents are and how the parents help shape the psychology of that individual. And parenting has been a focus of a lot of psychological research. Just in 2021, almost 2000 papers were published in psychology journals about the nature of parenting and its impact. Given that, it might be surprising to some of you that uh, there is a debate about the extent to which parents actually do contribute to the psychological development of the offspring they, they, um, they rear. And so what I'd like to do today is first of all, begin with a brief historical perspective on that debate, and then talk about, uh, in, in my abstract, I talked about four research domains, but in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get to mental health. So I'll talk about the three, personality, social political attitudes and academic uh, ability and achievement. And then I have a couple of conclusion uh, slides, but let me begin with the historical perspective. Um, psychology really differentiated out of philosophy at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And those early psychologists really uh, sought to establish psychology as our Darwinian discipline um, that they, sought to apply what they saw to be Darwinian principles to the study of human behavior. Uh, th that owed in large part to, to Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton, who, who was one uh, very early and prominent psychologist. This is a quote from uh, uh, Henry Goddard. He's an American uh, or was an American, uh, very prominent early developmental psychologist. And he, re I think, the quote reflects kind of the view of many early psychologists about how parents would impact their children psychologically. For someone like Godard, the parent contribution amounted to no more than contributing gametes, to contributing DNA. So psychology was very, Dar Dar not that Darwin would necessarily have agreed with the way psychology set out, but, but it was very Darwinian in the sense that it had a very strong biological or what we might today call a genetic orientation in the early 20th century. But that approach was pretty well uniformly discredited because the same people who were establishing these Darwinian principles also were using their research in order to, um, to back up the eugenics movement. And the association of early psychologies psychologists with the biological orientation with eugenics really led to almost the total abandonment of this approach in the early 20th century of psychology. That created a, a, a vacuum in the field and the vacuum was uh, filled with, uh, with an ideology that might be every bit as, uh, as radical as the, the ideology Goddard had. Um, something that the uh, the, the Harvard psychologist Steven Pinker has called the blank slate model of uh, human nature. And that is that uh, the biology didn't matter at all that, that what we inherited genetically from our parents 
doesn't matter what we were born blank slates ready to be written on uh, by our the, 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 the communities we lived in, um, the, the, the homes we were reared in, the friends we affiliated with. So this led to the models of, of mental health uh, that often attributed mental health problems or typically attributed mental health problems to deviant uh, parenting. So schizophrenia was caused by schizophrenogenic mother or autism was caused by um, unemotional uh, controlling refrigerator parents. And it wasn't just mental health was, that was seen to be attributable to the, uh, to the, to, to the nature of, of the parenting you received. Uh, Diana Bomberin is a very prominent, sadly she passed away a couple years ago, I believe, a very prominent developmental psychologist actually at my uh, alma mater, uh, alma mater uh, UC Berkeley. And Bomberin uh, developed what continues to be a very uh, important uh, model of parenting um, that was based on uh, the existence of two broad dimensions of parenting behavior. The first is warmth and the second is control. And then from these two dimensions, she identified four parenting styles that she felt uh, affected uh, ad adjustment within the normal range or the typical range, not just mental health. So uh, for example, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but for example, uh, authoritative parents, which is in the upper left-hand uh, quadrant here, are uh, parents who are high on warmth and high on control, and their children turn out great. They don't tend to have mental health problems, uh, and they tend to achieve academically. Whereas if you, if you go to the other end of the extreme, low warmth, low control, neglectful parents, neglectful parents put their, their children at risk for things like substance use disorders, which is something I do study. Around about uh, the, the late 20th century, behavioral geneticists started to re redo behavior or do again uh, behavioral genetic research, twin and adoption studies. And this led some prominent behavioral geneticists to question the dominant socialization model that existed within developmental psychology that we were really uh, determined psychologically by the parents that reared us. Um, and uh, several books were, were published in the 1990s that were popular accounts of questioning the importance of parents. Uh, David Rowe, I think most prominently Judith Harris, who also just recently died, who uh, questioned whether or not parents had much of an impact at all on the children they reared. Uh, Coming somewhat later, but a rather entertaining book is by Brian Kaplan. Brian Kaplan is an iconoclastic economist at George Mason University. And he's written this book, um, Selfish Regions to Have More Kids. And what he ended up doing is reading the behavioral genetic literature. And he concluded from that literature that parents actually, parenting behavior may not matter all that much. So don't worry about it. Just have a whole bunch of kids and in the end, they'll turn out just fine. In 2000, uh, a group of prominent developmental psychologists led by Andy Collins, Andy uh, retired recently from the Institute of Child Development here, uh, attempted a rapprochement uh, between the, the behavioral geneticists and the developmental psychologists as to the importance of parenting in psychological development. And he wrote a very important paper in the American Psychologist, which is uh, one of our major archival journals, uh, coming to what seems, as I write it down here, uh, a rather unremarkable conclusion that parental influences are neither or neither as unambiguous as earlier researchers, the schizophrenogenic mothers, uh, suggested, nor as insubstantial as the current critics, the behavioral genetics claim. Nonetheless, there are still some very prominent behavioral geneticists who question the impact of parenting. This is a, a quote from a, a very prominent, he's an American, but he's at King College London, Robert Plowman, who published a book uh, called Blueprint uh, a couple of years ago. Parents don't make much of a difference in their children's outcomes beyond the genes they provide at conception, which sounds very much like the 1920 quote from Goddard. 
So what I'd like to do in, in talking about research and now spend most of the time on personality is to try to use uh, examples from our own studies to try to illustrate the nature of the debate and to see if we can come to some conclusion. And the, the focus I'm gonna have is to try to answer the question that I had actually when I was an adolescent. And that is, when I grow up, am I gonna be like my dad? Uh, which really, uh, really bothered me at the time, although there probably would have been a much better outcome than, than I realized. And the, 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 the research context I'm gonna use is um, from the Minnesota Center for Twin and Family Research. And initially I'm gonna use something called the Minnesota Twin Family Study, MTFS. Uh, the longitudinal research we've been engaged in for the last 30 years has had a common sampling unit, which is a, a four member family, a pair of initially adolescent offsprings and their mothers and fathers. Even though psychologists talk a lot about parents, remarkably it's, it's not common for parents to participate in psychological research. So one of the things we set out to do when we started the studies back in the late 1980s was to make sure that we studied the parents as well as the offspring. And we have different types of families, but initially I'm gonna talk about families where the offspring are twins. They're either monozygotic twins, MZ twins, genetically identical effectively, or dizygotic twins, only light sex dizygotic twins, DZ twins. And this is a little bit complicated slide, but we've been doing this like forever, like th over 30 years. So we started, we had, there are three different cohorts that make it kind of complicated, but the overall uh, points are, are fairly straightforward. We started to assess the twins when they're either at age 11 or 17, and we followed them up periodically. And these are all the various follow-ups for the various cohorts until most of them now are middle-aged individuals. So we've seen their lives unfold as we followed them up over time. A couple of things about how we get the samples. Uh, the, the, the twins are actually ascertained or were ascertained from birth records maintained by the, the state of Minnesota. Um, so that, um, and, and they are uh, representative of the state of Minnesota for the birth years involved. So they have the, the full range of circumstances for uh, individuals born uh, between, I think it's 1974 and 1992 or something like that. However, there is one limitation about the sample that I think is important to point out here is that if you look at birth records at, at that era in Minnesota, overwhelmingly births were uh, white individuals. So roughly 95% of the, of the twins are white. So that's one limitation of this particular study. We have maintained fairly high uh, rates of participation over time, even though participation is not trivial. Usually they come in for a full day of assessments, about eight hours. Uh, we'll put them up in the hotel if, if, if need be. Uh, but we've maintained pretty well uh, the contact over the years with them. And we also have gotten almost all their parents, over 99% of the mothers and about 90% of the fathers. So we have, for the most part, it, there are 1,800, uh, almost 1,900 uh, families with twins. And in most of those families, we have both parents. So I'm gonna talk about personality. I'll just give a, a, a standard definition of personality. It, it corresponds to individual differences in characteristic ways of thinking and behaving. And I'm gonna differentiate that from psychopathology or mental health and cognitive ability, which I'll come to talk about a little bit later. Many of you will be familiar with the so-called big five model of personality that, uh, that is based on the notion that there are five broad dimensions of personality. You can't reduce personality to five dimensions, but that five dimensions are clearly very important and, and, and relatively universal across the world. In the, twin, in the twin study we've done, we've assessed uh, personality longitudinally, that is multiple times as people are developing. But rather than using a big five inventory, we use what might be considered a big three inventory um, that captures three of the five factors in the, the big five, but not all five. 
Positive emotionality is, is pretty much the same as extroversion in the big five system. Negative emotionality in our system is, is pretty much the same as neuroticism in the big five. Constraint is very similar to conscientiousness. And each one of these three broad dimensions, we actually have multiple scales. I'm not gonna go through too many of these as we go through this, but we actually have multiple scales targeting each one of these. Now, given I'm talking at a philosophy center, I thought I'd, I'd sneak in a, a quote from William James, uh, who we claim in psychology, Alan, uh, you probably claim him in philosophy too. Um, uh, you might ask, well, why bother assessing personality traits for immediately? Aren't they stable? In fact, uh, William James had many, many good insights. This was not one of them, though. Uh, James posited that our, our uh, personalities were fixed by the time we hit uh, 30, and they were set in stone and, and, and wouldn't really change much thereafter. In fact, psychological research indicates that personality continues to develop throughout most of our lives. And in thinking about how we might develop, uh, how our personalities might develop in a way that would make us more, more similar to our parents, there's two aspects to this. One is we'll become more like our parents just because we age. Uh, and everybody as they age, uh, the certain personality uh, characteristics tend to change as a function, uh, what we would call normatively in, in psychology. So if we look at those three broad dimensions of personality, and these are plots of all the personality me uh, measurements we've taken on these three. So you can see there are lots and lots of data points here for both men and women as a function of age. Um, what happens normatively, that is on average, as individuals age is uh, they become more constrained. That's true for both men and women. That's the red line. They become less neurotic, especially uh, going from adolescence to early adulthood. That's the green line. And in terms of uh, positive emotionality or extroversion, that's pretty flat across uh, the, the, uh, the lifespan. So yes, we become uh, more like our parents as we get older, but everybody becomes more like our parents as we become older. That's not the aspect of similarity I'm gonna be interested in. I'm gonna be interested in relative similarity. If my parents were high on neuroticism relative to their age peers, Am I likely also to be high on neuroticism relative to my age peers? So that's how I'm going to look at uh, personality similarity across generations. And we assess that using a, a correlation coefficient. That's a standard way of assessing it. And so we've measured personality similarity uh, repeatedly uh, across development. And what's represented here are the correlations between specific personality traits in a parent and an offspring. And I've broken them down in a couple of ways and I'll highlight these, but these are box plots and the box plots uh, give you the, the average or median correlation as well as where the, the, uh, the, the middle 50% interquartile range uh, lies as well as the individual data points of the various correlations. And each one of these has 89 correlations. So it's, it's a descriptive. I'm not really doing any statistical analysis here. But three things about this. One is uh, they're, they're, the correlations are not very high. Uh, the parent offspring, here's the mother offspring, father offspring. Mid-parent is the average of the mother and, and offspring. Each one of these, again, 89 correlations. The correlations are correlations run from zero, no relationship to one perfect relationship. These are weak associations. They're not zero, but they're weak. The mother, father, and the, uh, the mother offspring, the father offspring correlations are about the same. And we really don't get any evidence that the magnitude of the parent offspring correlation varies as a function of age. We have this, what seems like a little bit of an odd uh, data point here at 35, the, the actual sample sizes here might be lower. I, I think this is just anomalous, so I wouldn't worry about it. I do wanna point out, I, I will come, some of you might be wondering, there are some correlations here that are high and I will come back to those, I promise. But I wanna just convince you hopefully that a correlation of 0.16 is, it, it's not zero, but it's not very strong either. And, and I just, uh, I picked out one, uh, pairing where the correlation is actually exactly 0.16. Uh, 
It's between mother's neuroticism, negative emotionality, and offspring's negative emotionality. You can see we have a lot of data points here. So there's almost 3,000 data points. And yes, there's a correlation on, on average. Um, offspring have somewhat higher neuroticism scores if their mother had a high neuroticism score. But you can see there's extraordinary dispersion here. There's a weak association. So the, the, the first kind of take home message here is that, gee, our personalities aren't all that much like our parents' personality. But 0.16 isn't zero. So maybe that 0.16, even though it's not a large correlation, it certainly suggests that parents are doing something to shape the personality of their children. And developmental psychologists have identified three major mechanisms by which our parents might environmentally impact our psychological development. The first is almost passive, but that a major way we learn is by modeling people that we admire. And so perhaps we, we get transmission within a family through this modeling or social learning mechanism. But parents also can create a home environment that might foster the development of certain personality uh, characteristics or their approach to parenting, a la the Diana Bomron sort of uh, uh, framework might impact uh, how our personalities develop. This is the way developmental psychologists have traditionally thought about the association between parent and offspring. But if you go back to people like Judith Harris and David Rowe, one of their criticisms was is that in thinking about it this way, we've fail to account that parents might also be uh, similar to their offspring for genetic reasons, and that that confounds any resemblance we see. So there's a 0.16 resemblance here, but that might not be environmental. It might really be genetic. So in the 1990s, mid-1990s, I believe, we started a second study, and really the point of the second study was to try to better understand environmental mechanisms of uh, affecting the course of psychological development within families by factoring out the genetic component. And we sought to factor out the genetic component by uh, studying adoptive families. Um, we have four and nine adoptive families and adoptive family has the same configuration. We have, we don't know the birth parents, but we have the, the uh, rearing parents and two adolescent offspring initially, and then we followed them up over time. And then we also have 208 non-adoptive families. And non-adoptive families is where, are where the parents are both the rearing parent and the genetic parent. But the point of this study, and we haven't had as many follow-ups, but we also have them now, we follow them up into their 30s, is that um, the, 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 what I really wanna emphasize here is these adoptive families these individuals are, don't have really any basis for genetic resemblance. So if we see similarities here, they have to reflect some sort of environmental mechanism. So the reason we started this study, which, was called, which is called SIBS, was to really get a better handle on environmental transmission within families, factoring out the genetic component. The non-adoptive families, both genetic and environmental mechanisms are uh, taking place. I'm first going to look at the personality similarity here, just to make sure that we're getting similar results as we got in the previous study. And I'm going to display it in the same way. Uh, we do pretty much get the same sort of results. There are not as many parent offspring correlations, because for example, we don't have as many follow-ups. But you see a very similar pattern of, these are the, the non-adoptive parents. So they're both genetically uh, and environmentally related to the offspring here. Uh, and you can see this kind of modest correlation. But is this modest correlation a reflective of an environmental mechanism? We would draw the conclusion that they were if we also saw a similar pattern of correlation in the adoptive parents. What do we see in the adoptive parents? Here are the adoptive parent offspring correlations. Very trivial correlations, effectively near zero. There's almost no similarity between parents and offspring if they're not genetically uh, similar to one another. Again, I'll come back. There are outliers here. That's important, uh, but, but I'll come back to that in a little bit. 
So thinking about the developmental model and the potential environmental pathway, if we're talking about uh, the, the, the similarity between neuroticism in the parents and neuroticism in the kids, um, the, the adoption study suggests that at least one of these path mechanisms here is unlikely to be the case modeling. Um, because we don't see any similarity if they aren't genetically related. That doesn't rule out the other mechanisms. Maybe um, I'm neurotic, not because my mother was neurotic, but rather because my mother uh, created a home environment that made me neurotic. Maybe she was very demanding or very inconsistent. So it might not be direct social learning, but other aspects of the home environment created by the parents that are important. So how can we explore these other possibilities? The way behavioral geneticists have done that is actually indirectly um, by looking at similarity between siblings, or as you'll see in a second here, twins. Because if parents are creating an environment in the home, you might say, well, the most direct way of, 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 of uh, determining that is go in and measure these aspects. But it's not clear what the aspects of the home are. So an indirect way of, of looking at it is to see to what extent is there similarity uh, among the children growing up in the home that cannot be accounted for by genetics. So I'm gonna bring in twins now, and I'm gonna do that beginning again historically by an observation made by a prominent um, behavioral geneticist at the University of Texas, John Lowen. Lowland was doing twin studies back in the 70s. And back in the 70s, people did twin studies to show that things like personality had a heritable component to it. But when he was doing it, he, he observed a kind, what he thought was a very perplexing pattern. And that is, although the environment was clearly important and important contributor to individual differences in personality, it wasn't the type of environmental influence he was led to expect that would exist that it seemed to be independent of what he would typically have thought and most developmental psychologists would have thought at the time. So what did he observe? Uh, a little biometry here, very, very brief though. Uh, biometricians, the, the people who analyze family data, um, think about familial resemblance correlation as a function of the environments the relatives share and the genetics they share. And the environments they share is called uh, in this uh, formulation or in this approach, what's called the shared environment. So it's the impact of growing up together. I'm not gonna go through the mathematics of this, uh, but I'm just trying to explain what Lolan observed. Um, first of all, what he observed is that monozygotic twins never had identical personalities overall. Um, there was never perfect similarity in monozygotic twins. And because monozygotic twins have the same genotype, if they're not perfectly phenotypically similar, it has to be due to environmental differences between them. So the environment was always important. The shared environment, that is the impact of growing up together, however, seemed to be unimportant in his analysis. And the way he drew this conclusion, and I'm not gonna to try to explain the, the mathematics of this, um, is that if you engage in this biometric uh, analysis and you observe that the monozygotic twin correlation is at least twice as similar as the dizygotic twin uh, correlation, then you'll conclude that the shared environment is unimportant. And again, I'm not gonna explain that. I know it, it, it's probably fairly obscure, but I think I'll be able to make the point that Lolan was trying to make even without getting into the mathematics of it. So here is, some personality data for us. I said we, we administer uh, scales. There are 14 personality scales here. Uh, the light bars are the monozygotic twin correlations ranging from zero up to one. The monozygotic twin correlations across the board are never one. So the environment is always important because uh, they have the same genotypes, but they don't have the same personalities. The dizygotic twin correlations are in the darker blue. And the red dots is half the monozygotic twin correlation. And what you can see is, oops, sorry, what you can see is fairly consistently across 12 of the 14 scales, we see what uh, Lolan observed. The dizygotic twin correlation is not 
is great as tw a half the monozygotic twin correlation. In which case you'll say growing up together didn't have an impact on personality. There are two exceptions to that. Uh, one scale is alienation, the other is traditionalism. I'm gonna come back to traditionalism because that's an important exception. The pattern Lolan observed for personality, that is that the monozygotic twin correlation is uh, at least uh, twice the dizygotic twin correlation is actually an extremely robust pattern that you observe. This is a, a meta-analysis published in Nature Genetics a couple of years ago uh, by a, a Dutch um, researcher, geneticist actually, Tinka Poldeman. And you can see that there are a lot of twin studies. There are, I guess, over 2,700 uh, published twin studies, 17,000 different traits. Most of them have nothing to do with psychology. 14 million pairs of twins in her analysis. So this is a massive study. Um, and she concludes that the data are inconsistent with substantial influences from the shared environment. She consistently found, like Lowland did back in 1976, that uh, twice the uh, DZ correlation was less than the MZ correlation. Well, that's clearly an indirect way of getting at the effect of growing up in the same home. And it could be that the twin studies are just biased. There are certainly critics of twin research. This is a, a one critic, a Jay Joseph, who is a California psychologist. Uh, this is a, a, a nice quote from the dust jacket of this uh, book he wrote on twin studies uh, by a microbiologist from Harvard. Um, Jay Joseph doesn't believe that twin studies, he believes they're flawed and that they're giving incorrect results. The conclusion though, that growing up in the same home doesn't seem to have a great impact on personality similarity, doesn't rest with twin studies alone. And in fact, one of the things that we've done and others could do as well, is we've looked at individuals' adoptive siblings. So these are individuals growing up in the same home that are not genetically related to one another. If growing up in the same home impacts your level of neuroticism, then two non-genetically related individuals growing up in that same home, and they were placed in the homes at an average age of four months. So they developed in those homes. They should have similar levels of neuroticism or extroversion or whatnot. So if I go back to the, the graph here, where before I had the MZ and DZ correlations, now I put the correlation between these genetically unrelated individuals who grew up in the same home. This is the darkest blue. And for the most part, they're non-significantly different from zero. There are a couple ex uh, exceptions. Again, uh, alienation and tradi uh, traditionalism are exceptions. They, they are significantly, uh, actually only the traditionalism one amounts to much of a correlation. These are statistically significant, although they're not that great. In general, studies of unrelated individuals growing up in the same home, I'm gonna skip the next slide in the interest of time, um, generally come to the same conclusion. So what can we conclude from personality? First of all, very quick, clearly, there's not a lot of par parent offspring personality resemblance for most traits. And it doesn't appear that what resemblance exists doesn't appear to vary much by age. Twin studies of personality going back to Lowland in the 70s generally imply little impact of shared environment. Adoptive parent offspring and adoptive sibling personality resemblance is generally near zero. But those are all general conclusions. And there may be personality traits that do not follow this general pattern, which gets me to my second topic I wanna to touch on. Gotta to make sure I don't run out of time here, Alan. Ooh, okay. Social political attitudes. So this, I, this is the, the first display of parent offspring personality correlations I gave you before. Again, 89 in each of these, but clearly there's some outliers here. In general, they're very modest, but there are some outliers here. The outliers all involve the same personality scale, the traditionalism scale at different, the, what's the underscore here are the different ages at which traditionalism was, was, um, was assessed in the offspring. So yeah, although in general, there's very little similarity in, in, in personality between parents and offspring, 
for traditionalism, that's there is actually a moderate degree of similarity. And traditionalism is unique in other ways. And I've, I've already highlighted it in a couple of previous slides. Um, we've already seen that in non-adoptive families, the parent offspring correlation is typically greater than 0.3. In adoptive families, the parent offspring correlation is typically greater than 0.2 for traditionalism. In twin studies, the DZ correlation is greater than half the MZ correlation, a pattern that twin researchers would say imp implies shared environmental effects. And the adoptive sibling correlation is greater than 0.3. Traditionalism is an interesting scale. I've just picked two of the personality scales that we assess here and given you some representative items. Aggression, if you look at the items of, for aggression, what they reflect are things, ways you might behave in certain situations. So you might hurt, hit somebody or hurt somebody. Traditionalism, if you look at the items, they're not asking you about the way you behave, but rather what you think is right or wrong, good or bad, or what your preferences are. What traditionalism is, is quite different from the other personality traits. It's more akin to what political scientists would call a social attitude. And in the early 2000s, political scientists got interested in behavioral genetics and trying to understand social and political attitudes from a behavioral genetic perspective, doing twin, primarily twin studies. Pete Hatami is a, a prominent political scientist at Penn State University who did some of the early twin studies in political science. And here's a, a conclusion he reached is that when you did those twin studies of political ideology, he came to the conclusion that parents don't appear to have much of an impact on our political attitudes, our social attitudes beyond the genetic contributions they make. Again, kind of hearkening back to the Plowman and Goddard, the quotes I gave you earlier. So along with, uh, this is a project that uh, Emily Willoughby, who's now a postdoc with us, uh, took on when she was a graduate student. We really wanted to, because of the, the, the findings with things like traditionalism, we really wanted to look at this issue a little bit more closely. Um, this is a paper that we published uh, just a couple months ago um, by looking at our adoption study. And in this case, the adopted individuals are adults. They're in their 30s. So we're looking at the similarity in their social and political attitudes when they're adults. And if, the, if I were to believe Hatami, we should expect no similarity if they're not genetically related to one another. Uh, we measured multiple aspects. I don't have enough time to go through all these, but the, the, they're not independent, they're intercorrelated, but they're multiple aspects of political orientation, uh, social attitudes, like whether or not you, you uh, support egalitarianism or income redistribution, cultural liberalism, uh, being punitive, being religious. And when we looked at the parent offspring correlations, these are the ones for non-adoptive, so they're both genetically and environmentally related. The ones for adoptive are not as large as the one for the non-adoptive. We would interpret that as likely indicating some uh, form of genetic transmission, but they're not zero. They're actually quite substantial consistently, so that social attitudes appears to be one exception to the general rule that behavioral geneticists have, have drawn that Growing up in, the, in, in a home does not lead to psychological similarity. This is just an overall regression. If we aggregate uh, the individual uh, social attitude components into an aggregate, uh, this is in the non-adoptive families and the adoptive families. You see, they're not as similar, but there's still quite strong resemblance in adoptive families. That resemblance cannot be due to genetic factors here. It has to be environmental. I'll skip that. Okay, the last uh, example I want to go through is academic ability and achievement. Uh, this is probably the most fraught area of, of, of behavioral genetics, but it's also an area of behavioral genetics where there's a lot of research. Um, this is uh, going back to the Poldeman review. Um, she actually breaks down studies uh, depending upon the phenotype, uh, what was being measured. And it turns out that 
across all the twin studies she looked at, uh, roughly 400,000 pairs of twins uh, have been studied for their similarity and cognitive ability. And what's plotted here, I'm interested in the environmental effect here uh, rather than the other effects. The green is the shared environmental effect, the environmental effect of growing up together as a function of age. Uh, what Polderman et al. concluded is that there is a shared environmental effect when the, the twins are in the home, but it, it quickly dissipates and is near zero once you hit adulthood. And other people who have reviewed the literature uh, have made the same conclusion about cognitive ability. Um, this is actually my uh, PhD mentor, Tom Bouchard, who retired here a few years ago from the University of Minnesota. This is a, a, a narrative review of the relevant literature, not only twin, but adoption studies, where he comes to the same conclusion that the data from Polderman would suggest that the shared environment is not that important for cognitive ability, at least in adulthood. Uh, our own data, if you look at the resemblance of cognitive ability in adolescence and adulthood in uh, non-adopted and adopted families, the blue being the non-adopted, it's stronger in the non-adopted. It's not zero in the adopted, um, but it's not that strong either. So the, the behavioral genetic twin adoption literature would generally uh, support the conclusion that growing up in the same home doesn't seem to have a, a, an enduring large effect on general cognitive ability and other cognitive ability. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have an impact on children's academic success because there's other aspects of academic success. So for example, in a paper, another graduate student of ours, Lisa Anderson, took the lead on, if we look at educational attainment in our adoptive families and non-adoptive families, so this is the number of parents who have a college degree. This is the rate at which their offspring have a college degree. Uh, you can see that there's a stronger association between college attainment in the non-adoptive than the adoptive families, but there's clearly a, a non-zero relationship in the adoptive families. There's, and again, this has to be environmentally mediated. The, uh, the, the strength of association, if you're interested in terms of odds ratio, I can't see it because of the placement here is 1.6 for, uh, so the odds of, of having a college degree goes up by 60% if, uh, if you have an, uh, each additional adoptive parent who's, um, who has a college degree, but it goes up threefold if that's a non-adoptive parent. And, and we would interpret that difference as uh, reflecting genetic factors. But what's most, what we're trying to focus on here is the adoptive effect, which has to be environmental. Why do adoptive parents who have a college education, uh, how are they able? What's the mechanism by which their, their children are also uh, at an increased likelihood of getting a college education? Well, a reasonable, conjecture would be is that because they convey the types of academic skills that are needed to succeed in, in, uh, in educational pursuits to their offspring. Um, the economist at University of Chicago, the Nobel laureate economist, James Ekman, has argued that educational success and actually occupational success owes not only to cognitive ability, but also personality factors that are non-cognitive, things like uh, the willingness to work hard, to delay reinforcement, and that um, both of these are predictive of how far and into what's plotted here are just the means of these uh, in college in, uh, individuals who completed college versus those who didn't, both in the adopted and non-adopted offspring. And so you can see that in both cases, cognitability and these personality factors predict the likelihood that, that someone completes college. But is the parent effect owing to them conveying or transmitting these skills across the generation, for the most part, no. Um, the, there's a slight effect of adoptive parent college uh, completion on the cognitive abilities of their non-genetically related offspring. There's, almost, there's no effect on personality. We do get an effect in the non-adopted families, but again, we would interpret that effect as not probably not environmentally mediated because of the difference here. 
Nonetheless, the adoptive parents are able to increase substantially, I would say, the, the likelihood of their children uh, complete college, but it doesn't seem they're doing it primarily through skill enhancement. How do they do it then? Um, we've ex explored various factors. I'm gonna only highlight a couple here. Um, they have high ex academic expectations for their children, and they're actually willing to uh, expend their own time to help them get in to college by, among other things, just helping them complete their college applications. So there is an environmental mechanism here. It may not be that, th there might be some skill enhancement. I don't wanna totally discount that, but uh, a, a large part of it may be through other things, uh, social capital that, that, that the adoptive parents have that facilitates the success of their parent, uh, their offspring. I'm gonna skip, there, there is another way of getting at this called genetic nurture. And, and just because I've, I've come to the end of the hour, I'm gonna skip over this. If somebody wants to talk about genetic nurture, I'll come back to the slides because I wanna to get to the, just the overall conclusion. Just had a couple of slides there. But genetic nurture is another way uh, of looking at what we looked at in the adoptive uh, offspring for uh, these environmental effects for academic ability and achievement. And it provides a way of actually validating or confirming the, the same observations we were making there. So very briefly, uh, I, I'm not sure you'll conclude, but what, I, what would I conclude? First of all, that the impact of parent behavior on psychological development has probably been overestimated in developmental psychology. And, um, you probably could discount, I, in my opinion, you can have a different opinion, but in my opinion, you could probably discount a lot. I, I would agree with Kaplan. Uh, you, you probably could discount a lot of what you have in those self-help self -help parenting books. At the same time, behavioral geneticists have almost certainly underestimated the impact of parent behavior. Uh, parents do more than just contribute their DNA to the psychological development of their offspring. There are some psychological traits where the parent, the environmental parenting effect appears to be substantial. I've given you two, social attitudes and um, educational attainment and academic pursuits. Um, if we had had time to talk about mental health, I think that would, there are aspects of mental health that would be a third. I think actually, if you think about it, that may make sense that parents, I'm not sure parents set out to make their kids, maybe some parents do, make their kids uh, high on extroversion, but parents do tend to want their kids to do well in school and to have a good uh, moral foundation. And it's it, that our, our data would suggest that it's actually in those domains where they seem to be having the greatest effect. The last thing is, I, I think there's another possibility that's really hard in these large scale studies to actually ferret out, but I do believe it also, I, I don't have any illustrations of it here, but I do believe it also takes place. I wish I had a, a paradigm to study it. And I think that in some families, there might be some specific traits that those families are especially effective in transmitting across generations. And I think about political ambition, uh, probably many of you are too young to, to remember the Kennedys, um, but Joe Kennedy, the, the patriarch of the family was extremely politically ambitious and he successfully transmitted that um, to his offspring. Um, so whereas uh, political ambition might not be transmitted in most families, some families might be particularly effective in transmitting it. And that might be a model for other traits. Perhaps there are other examples and other things. Okay, these are all the papers I cited, so or draw due data from. Again, thank you for your time. Thank you, Alan, for giving me a chance uh, to talk again at the Philosophy Center. And um, I'm, I'm open to, to questions if, if you have any. So thanks. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, so let's transition then into our discussion and question time. Uh, you can ask questions in um, several different ways. You can use the raise hand function 
and I will um, call on you and unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Um, I can also uh, take a question in the chat if you put it there um, and also a question in the Q&A function. And I will toggle back and forth between those three. Um, uh, so please choose whichever you would like to do. Um, and uh, I'm going to start us off, Matt, with a question that came in the Q&A function. Um, it says the following, your research describes what you see in observational studies, which is fascinating. What does it say about the effectiveness of intervention or, quote, prevention efforts related to, say, academic achievement? Can we use this information to do better jobs as educators or select students in ways that result in improved outcomes or going further, influencing one's political persuasions? Um, so I can, that's a great question, of course. And, and what I'm talking about here are the ways behavioral geneticists have tried to use genetic designs to understand how parents might influence their offspring. There is an experimental literature, of course, interventions who, that target parenting, uh, parenting behavior. I'm not, I, I'm not really familiar with any that have, have attempted to, to uh, do that in order to encourage certain political attitudes. Um, I'm not sure that those exist, but they certainly exist in the academic domain. Um, and I think our data are generally consistent with that in the sense that um, with those intervention studies, I'll just mention one, There's, it, it's a small study, but it's a very influential study. Um, the, what's called the Perry, many people at least know about the study because you hear about it, you might not know the name of it. Uh, it's a study called the Perry Preschool uh, Study, which was done in the 1960s, I think. Uh, which was an experiment. There was, it, it was only about 120 or so, it was a preschool intervention. So it was only about 120 or so kids. Um, but one of the things they, they observed, so the, the, the original focus of the intervention was to, to raise, uh, there's a control group and an intervention group, but was to raise the, the cognitive ability of the, uh, of the participants in the uh, experimental treatment arm. Um, what they found is that they were able to raise the cognitive ability, but it quick, that, that effect quickly wore off. And in fact, if you look, there's quite a few intervention studies, especially from the 60s, but even after that, that sought to raise the cognitive ability uh, through interventions of preschool children in order to enhance their academic achievement later on. And they're fairly consistent in showing that, yes, you could have a, a short-term effect, but that effect wore off within, let's say, a couple of years. The interesting thing about the Perry program and the reason that you might have heard about its results is that Heckman, who I mentioned in my talk, Heckman came back to reanalyze that data uh, when the Perry preschool kids actually became adults themselves. And what he found was that um, that they, uh, they that even though they, they they didn't have higher cognitive ability scores than the control group, they did do better in life. They are more likely, for example, to um, uh, to stay in school and, and get a degree. They were more likely to be uh, to be employed. Uh, to have a good job, to make a certain amount, to not be on government assistance. So they, he, they, they observed this effect, uh, but it couldn't obviously be due to cognitive ability because even though that was the original goal was to raise their cognitive ability scores because that would have a long-term impact. What, what Heckman showed, I think, I'm convinced by it, even though, again, the sample is kind of small, is that probably what happened is what, what was changed here was the character of, of the children, not their uh, cognitive abilities. And that that's the reason why they succeeded later in life. I think our data are generally consistent with 
with that. Although obviously the, the, the Perry program preceded ours by quite a bit. Again, I apologize. I don't really know of any that have tried to intervene. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't know of any that have tried to intervene on social attitudes. Okay, great. So let's move on. Floor is open. And I just had another question come in the Q&A from Isabella Stallworthy. It says, I'm curious about where the evidence stands regarding ways in which certain environments for example, poverty may diminish or augment parents' genetic contributions to child development or otherwise alter the avenues through which parents might exert influence. Okay, that's a great question. Was it from somebody specific, Alan? Yeah, so Isabella Stallworthy is the- Okay, okay, thank you, Isabella. Um, so, what behavioral geneticists would say is that you're asking about a, a gene environment inter interaction. And I didn't say anything throughout the talk about gene environment interactions. Um, and developmentalists and behavioral geneticists both believe that gene environment interactions are, are, are very important. One of the things, one of the limitations, and I should have mentioned this is going through, one of the limitations of studies like this, this, the studies we're doing, even though the samples are representative of the state of Minnesota for the most part, the number of people in our samples that are really extremely impoverished is small. And so we'll have maybe limited in, uh, power or sensitivity to study the effects of something like poverty. However, there are other studies, larger studies than even ours, and ours is not a small study. We've, stu we've studied 10,000 people over the years, um, but larger studies that have uh, looked at the impact of poverty on things like the genetic, the, the estimate of the genetic influence from twin studies on cognitive ability. And if you look at that data, what the data suggests is generally consistent with is that it, 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 high levels of poverty, genetics seems to be, the importance of genetics seems to be diminished on academic outcomes. Um, the, at, at, at low levels of poverty or, what, or the other end of the continuum, middle class or, or wealthy of families, uh, genetics, appears to be important to academic pursuits. But it, it, in an impoverished family, it appears to be primarily the environment that's important. Now there is, interestingly enough, um, in meta-analysis of this phenomena, there are uh, comparisons between um, the US and Europe, and this finding that genetics may be diminished, the genetic impact on cognitive uh, outcomes may be diminished in poor environments seems to be something that's more characteristic of the US than of European countries. And unfortunately, there, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of, there is not a lot of research up, uh, outside of either North America or Europe. So I can't really comment on other areas. So in, in response, Isabella, in response to your, your question, I think in general, that observation is held up. Okay. Um, floor is open. Questions either ask yourself or use the raise uh, to use the raise hand function to let me know that, or uh, drop it in the chat or in the Q and A uh, module, whichever is easiest for you. Um, just, uh, I've got uh, one coming, uh, two, okay, good. So let's go first to um, uh, Charlie Geyer. Charlie, you should be able to talk now. Okay. 
Am I coming through? You are, but you're a little faint. Okay, I'll turn up the mic. I didn't, I wasn't ready for that. Okay, better? Yes, that works. Go ahead. So I was just wondering about this uh, non-shared environment. So what does that look like? We, yeah, we talk about the share. Yeah, I didn't talk about it at all. Thank you, Charlie. So that's it. Um, so one of the thing is, so for sure, in any psychological trait, monozygotic twins are, are just never correlated one. And again, because they have the same genotypes, an absence of a perfect correlation for the trait has to reflect for the most, it, it has to reflect environmental mechanisms Behavioral genesis call those environmental factors non-shared because they have to be environmental factors that produce differences, right, between the monozygotic twin. So what are those environmental factors? Um, he, here's the, the remarkable thing, uh, Charlie, is that despite a lot of effort, there's been little progress in identifying specific non-shared environmental factors. And in fact, there's a term for this, in the field is called the gloomy prospect. Um, and this goes back, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years even. And that is, even though, let's say personality, uh, the majority of, of individual differences in personality appears to be attributable to these non-shared environmental factors. But despite some very large research projects, no one's been able to identify what those are. So why is that? It, one explanation is that they're idiosyncratic. So that what makes me neurotic is different from what made, you're not neurotic, but let's just imagine. Sure what I am, made, go ahead. <laughs> but what made you neurotic? So, so you have different experiences that led to your neuroticism than, yeah. than mine, completely different. Um, they're, they're idiosyncratic events. And, and if that's the case, and some people, and that's why it's considered a gloomy prospect, because it kind of reduces down to biography, because you can't really aggregate across individuals, because for each individual, why they turned out that way is really unique to that individual. So it's, it's so the, the, the short answer is, the behavioral genesis believe they're extremely important, but have generally failed to identify what exactly corresponds the, they correspond to. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, so moving to uh, another question here from Lauren Wilson. Uh, who has asked if you could go back and explain genetic nurturing, which you kind of had to skip over there at the end. Uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit on that would be helpful. Can I use my slides to do that? Absolutely. Okay. okay. So, um, I'll go. So, one of the things that I'll point out before getting into genetic nurture is that twin studies, adoption studies, and I've kind of glossed over this here, there, there's a lot of assumptions that go along with them. They certainly have their limitations. And so in our area, we were reluctant to draw strong conclusions based on one type of observation. For example, based on the observations that twins and monozygotic twins tend to be more than twice as similar as dizygotic twins, uh, we would be, I think, generally reluctant to draw the conclusion that, okay, growing up in the same home doesn't matter because it, 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 there could be a flaw in the method. J. Joseph might be right. So you, we, we tend to wanna to try to identify other ways at, at getting at the same thing. And what are we trying to get at? We're trying to understand the extent to which parents environmentally shape the children they raise. Uh, genetic nurture is something that uh, came along, oh, maybe three or four years ago, but it's there's actually quite a lot of publications on it now. Uh, it's an odd term, but okay, I didn't make up the term. So if you, if you think about the parent's genotype, 
and why it might be related to the child's phenotype. Well, it, if there is a genetic pathway, then parents' genotype, right, uh, determines the child's genotype. And if it's a heritable trait, what we would call heritable trait, uh, then there's a mechanism by which the parent's genotype would be associated with the child's phenotype. But there's also the possibility that the parent's genotype has an effect or is associated with the child's phenotype independently of its effect on the child's phenotype. But if the parent's genotype has this dashed effect here, then that can't be a genetically mediated effect. Even though you're talking about the relationship between their genotype and the kid's phenotype, any genetic effect of the parents on the kid's phenotype has to be mediated by the kid's phenotype, genotype, right? So if you get evidence of this pathway here, it has to be environmentally uh, mediated. How would it be environmentally mediated? Well, presumably because the parent's genotype is affecting some phenotype in the parents and it's that phenotype of the parents that's affecting the child's phenotype. So what genetic nurture tries to do is to identify if there's a, it doesn't tell you what the mechanism, specific mechanism is, but tries to again, control for the genotype in looking at parent offspring resemblance to see if there's some environmental mechanism going on this dotted line. In order to do this though, you have to measure the genotype of the child and the genotype of the parent as well as the phenotype of the child, of course. Um, until recently, you couldn't do that. But now you can because of GWAS. Uh, you can interrogate the whole, whole genome of individuals. You can measure their genotype. And so what we've done, and this is, uh, this is uh, based on uh, research that James Lee uh, has done, in, I think over a million individuals, yeah. So this is a GWAS of educational attainment, um, Manhattan plot. So each one of these is, uh, anything above the dotted line is a significant association of a particular genetic variant, a SNP, and, uh, and educational attainment. And you can aggregate the effects of all these SNPs into what are called polygenic scores by uh, weighting, uh, the SNP is a genetic variant, weighting each individual SNP by the magnitude of its effect. That gives you an overall aggregate effect of the, of the genetic, uh, what you know about the genetics of this case, it, it's educational attainment. So GWAS, large scale GWAS, and the ability to derive these summary polygenic scores from the GWAS give us a way to kind of get to, to get at aspects of the parent's genotype and the child's genotype. So in a paper that I, again, Emily took the lead on, what she did is she created, we, we've uh, genotyped our participants in, in over 500,000 genetic variants. And so we can create these scores. Um, using the GWAS results. So if you look at educational attainment, that's what the original GWAS was uh, looking at. The offspring's polygenic score accounts for 9.3% of their educational attainment. What's educational attainment? It's years in school. Um, the light blue here is the additional variance accounted for by the parent's genotype once the child's genotype is accounted for. So this can't be due to genetics. All the genetics is here. They, it's not a lot, 1.8%, but it's highly statistically significant. So this first, so this would be considered a genetic nurture effect. It, it's, it's limited in the sense that it doesn't tell you what the mechanism is, and it really doesn't tell you how strong it is because you're, you're only measuring a subset of the relevant genetics here, but it tells you something environmentally is going on. So the first thing Emily showed in this paper was that just like in our adoption study where we see adoptive parents' education predicts their the college completion of their offspring, adopted offspring, which is an environmental effect. We're also getting an environmental effect here in educational attainment using a completely different design, this genetic nurture design. That's educational attainment, but she also looked at whether or not you get these genetic nurture effects for general cognitive ability, as well as a, uh, the, the personality factors associated with academic success. Uh, the educational attainment uh, 
polygenic score accounts for 8% of cognitive ability in the offspring. If you add in the parent's genetic score, it has very little incremental value. Similarly here, although this one I think is marginally statistically significant. So I think the important thing for me here and, and for us anyway, is that this genetic nurture, which again, there are many studies now on genetic nurture, not just for educational attainment, for a lot of different phenotypes, because geneticists are interested in using genetic designs to try to interrogate environmental mechanisms, is that what this would indicate to me, or my interpretation of this, is that indeed there is an environmental effect here on the transmission of educational attainment across generations that's reflected here. It doesn't appear to be strongly coming through the underlying skills, which again, I would say is generally consistent with what we are showing in the adoption studies. Okay. I'll stop sharing my screen. Great, thank you. So we've got a couple more questions. Uh, this one from Valerie Tiberius, who says, thanks for a great talk. My not very scholarly question, if you're ever on a plane and someone asks you what, to, what you do and you tell them about your research and they want advice about parenting, what do you tell them? Do you steer people away from parenting books? Do you tell them to just relax, except for the social attitudes they convey and the insistence on college? Um, um, well, you, okay, so <laughs> you definitely don't want to ask me about parent. Well, you have to see my kids. My kids <laughs> turned out fine. Um, I can tell you, Valerie, what I did, and, and I, I do take this seriously. I do think that parents, as I, I, I tried to convey in, in the conclusion, is that parents do have an impact, but they have an impact in certain domains. I've, I've actually talked with, with parents about this. My own strategy and my, my spouse's strategy was to try to put children into situations where they're likely to affiliate with other individuals, other age mates, peers, um, that are going to encourage positive psychological development. And there's a lot of ways of doing that, of course, is to you know, extracurricular activity. It could be sports, although in, in my case, my daughters were not involved in sports, but they're involved in the arts and that sort of thing. Um, because from my perspective, it, 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 at least in terms of the types of things we tend to worry about in adolescence, in, in terms of not only academic pursuits, but, but also uh, getting into trouble and, and, and substance abuse, uh, peers are gonna be more important, I think, than, than parents. And so I always try to, to have an influence by trying to uh, limit their peer group, but recognizing that in the end, they're gonna cho choose their peer group, but at least creating the, the opportunities so that they were uh, they brought into contact with, with individuals who are likely to, to, to encourage positive psychological development. So that's kind of my answer. I don't know if that's a very helpful answer, but, but certainly that's the, the strategy I tried to take anyway. Okay, so this next question actually is related, but has a different audience in mind than um, uh, those who are parenting, but rather the developmental psychology community. So someone asks, you said this work suggests that parenting has limited effects in these significant uh, domains of academics and personality, yet it would seem that the field of developmental psychology may not take this body of work very seriously. Uh, why not? So maybe the commentary there about the way in which some of these uh, studies are metabolized by others. So again, in, in the academic domain, I, I hopefully I didn't, uh, I didn't intend to make the, the, the conclusion or draw the conclusion that uh, parenting wasn't important. I, I do think it's important. It's clearly important for how far children go in school. That's for sure. It, there, there are other behavioral genetic research that's consistent with that. Um, Nonetheless, uh, you are right. I think that the um, that behavioral genetic research is is not 
necessarily accepted by all or even the mainstream of developmental psychology. Uh, it's hard for me to, to explain why, because I, 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 I'm not part of that community. Um, I do think though that it does challenge the way people have traditionally looked at socialization. That I, I think most developmental psychologists now would acknowledge that there are genetic factors at play. Um, but if you really believe the results of behavioral genetic research on that genetic factors contribute to familial resemblance, and you want to understand the uh, how the the basis for familial resemblance from an environmental perspective, you, I would argue, have to do something about the genetics. And I think that makes it much more difficult to do research. So I, I'm not saying that, that developmental psychologists don't do behavioral genetics because of that. There are a lot of developmental psychologists though have embraced, um, embraced behavioral genetics as well. Uh, a very prominent one was, uh, he sadly passed away very recently, uh, Michael Rudder. Michael Rudder, uh, British, um, is one of the most important developmental psychologists of the 20th century. And he, late in his career, after reviewing the behavioral genetic literature, he became convinced that yes, genetics is important. And I, no matter what I'm doing, I need to factor that in to the types of studies I'm doing. I think it'll be easier with the genomic age, but maybe I'm being naive there, because it's gonna be easier to genotype people. And so you don't have to study twins or adoptees that can be hard to ascertain for your study, but you could, you could do like the genetic nurture type of study. So I think we have time for one last short question. If somebody has one, it looks like one just came in. So uh, from Mark Borello, uh, what do we gain regarding understanding parenting or educational achievement from behavior genetics? So this kind of follows on your last comment there. What do we gain regarding understanding parent or educational achievement from behavior genetics? And maybe the we there could be interpreted in a couple different ways. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not sure what do you, what you mean by what do we gain? The, what I was trying to, to talk about is how behavioral genetic designs help us understand the nature of environmental transmission within families. And I would argue, and again, back to the previous question, I, there are plenty of people who disagree with me, but I would argue that it's virtually impossible to do that within families without taking the genotype into account. I think what we've learned is that, yes, there, there are uh, mechanisms of environmental transmission. They're not necessarily always the ones that we have traditionally expected in psychology. Um, and that uh, I think what the behavioral genetic literature has done is suggested alternative mechanisms for understanding why parents and offspring come to resemble one another. I'm not sure I've answered the question, but I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly what the question is trying to get at. Well, that will have to be for another day because we are at the end of our time here. So I want to say thank you, Matt, for the talk and for the discussion, for everyone who joined us today. Uh, listening in and asking questions. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it and found it stimulating. And um, we look forward to seeing you um, at another talk in the near future. But until then, if you are in Minnesota, stay warm. And wherever you are, stay safe. Thank you again, Matt. Everyone have a lovely weekend. Yeah, thank you, Alan. And thank you, everybody, for participating. <laughs>